Good afternoon, everyone. Um, here we are at our new time. Uh, just some scheduling issues. Uh, my wife is trying to finish up her schooling. Um, she's doing really well. She's making a really good pace, and uh, we wanted to kind of facilitate that as best we could. So um, we decided to move the, the time to the afternoon slot here at 4.30. And uh, that way uh, I could uh, make sure the kids stayed in bed and give her some peace and quiet while she works on her studies. So today we're going to do Exodus 25. Um, it's a 40 verse chapter. We're not going to uh, try to go beyond that. Um, I don't know that we're going to go a full hour this time. I think we're, we're probably going to make some pretty good time here. Um, a few things to discuss, but what essentially happens is, is Moses is up on the mountain and he is talking with God for 40 days and 40 nights. And the first instructions that are recorded here are the building of the, the Ark or the Chest of the Covenant, um, and then the uh, Tabernacle, and then a table that was kind of a, a dinner setting with some lamps on it and some dishes and where they would keep uh, unleavened bread, what they call the show bread for uh, just a representative of God eating with them at the table. So um, anyway, for those of, you, those of you who are able to join me, um, if you would uh, say hello so I can see who all is here. Um, I'm gonna pull up my phone here. Just I know that my phone has some functionality that my computer just doesn't have. Um, so maybe I'll see comments and who all is watching at the time. But anyway, we're gonna talk about those real quick and then uh, We'll be done for the day. Um, I probably will spend uh, the at least for a while the videos that I'm doing. I'm probably going to do one chapter, but I'm going to try to do it more frequently. So this may only be like 30 minutes or so. We'll see how it goes. Um, if you do get something out of this, feel free to share. Uh, it is set to public, so anybody can share. Also, we have it up on YouTube, um, and that's uh, Swordmaster Publications. You can uh, subscribe there. I'll try to remember to drop a link eventually. Hey wife, glad you could uh, could join for a minute. Um, I know you're busy studying and, and whatever, so. Uh, all right, so we're in Exodus chapter 25, and um, we are, uh, I'm reading out of the King James. Um, I will definitely be referring to the ESV, and I have a number of words up from the Hebrew just to kind of point out what they are. Just to, to be clear, um, we'll talk a little bit about the meaning of what some of this is, and uh, we'll, uh, we'll start off the references here, but probably what's going to happen is I'm, I'm going to start it here, but as we, as we move forward through uh, the Bible, we'll come back to it and we'll say, remember, we'll remember. We're going to do that with the cherubim here in a minute. So, all right, uh, <clears throat> so let's get started. Exodus chapter 25, verse 1 of the Lord. Uh, or Jehovah spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children. Now remember, he's up on the mountain, and God's talking to him. It's just God and Moses right now. Um, and so God's giving Moses instruction. He says, Speak unto the children of Israel, that they bring me an offering. Of every man that gives it willingly with his heart, you shall take my offering. So this was, God is saying, this is kind of an extra thing that I'm asking of them. Uh, it's a big thing, but I don't want anybody to give if they can't give willingly. Uh, it's a voluntary thing, and there was no repercussions for not giving. Um, but he says, I want you to, to ask everybody to bring these things and tell them what it's for. And uh, if, they, if they give it willingly, then take it, and you're going to do this. <clears throat> you're going to build this thing. Okay, so verse 3, And this is the offering which you shall take of them, gold and silver and brass, and blue and purple and scarlet and fine linen and goat's hair. Ram skins dyed red, and badger skins, and shittim wood. Now that shittim wood in the King James um, comes from the Hebrew word, uh, but they did kind of a transliteration as opposed to a translation. It's actually acacia wood, which is like a, a beautiful, uh, like it has a gray bark on the outside, but it has a, a beautiful red wood uh, inside, and it's a very straight wood. The, the trees grow very straight and tall. And so uh, it's a good it's a good wood for for building things with. So um, anyway, it's going to say shittim wood. I will probably use shittim and acacia interchangeably as I read through here because I do some of my own translating from the King James as I read. Um, all right, 
uh, verse 6, oil for the light, spices for anointing oil and for sweet incense, onyx stones and stones to be set in the ephod and in the breastplate. So here's here's some things that are going to be donated like all at the beginning, but they're for different parts of what's going to be going on. Um, the onyx stones, the ephod and the breastplate, those are, those are actually priestly vestments, which we aren't going to get to in this chapter. Um, we'll cover those more when we get to them. And let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. Um, so this is going to be the tabernacle. According to all that I show you after the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all the instruments thereof, even so shall you make it. So God's going to give Moses a pattern. And there's, there's a, a very powerful message in this. Just like with Noah and the ark, God gives a pattern for building. And this, this idea is not just a, a, an offhand comment that God makes. God says this over and over again throughout the Old and the New Testament. This idea of, of when God lays out a pattern, make sure that you do it the way that I said to do it. And um, when we see the building of the tabernacle, when we see the building of the temple in the Old Testament, God is very specific about the pattern. And the interesting thing about the tabernacle and the temple is these are types pointing forward to the anti-type, which is the New Testament temple. And um, most everybody, I think, understands that the New Testament temple is the church. Um, it's not a physical building. It's not a location, but it is uh, the, the organization of people that are part of Christ's kingdom. That it is, it is the church, the kingdom, the bride, the temple. Um, there's only one, and God had a specific pattern for it. And so it's very important that when we look at the pattern in the New Testament for the temple that God says to build the church, that we follow that pattern. And so many of the, of the denominations of the world don't follow that pattern. They come up with their own pattern and they do it their own way. Uh, as so much of, of what is seen in the world, their worship and their, their doctrines and, and their, their practices, uh, a lot of that is their own pattern and it's not following the pattern that God has made. So it's very, very important. Uh, God says, follow the pattern that I have given you. All right? And so verse 10, and they shall make an ark. So that first word that, that we're looking at here is ark. Um, and the idea in, in the Hebrew, the word is aron, and it's an ark, a chest, or even can be considered a coffin. So it was a big box is essentially what we're looking at, is, is some kind of a chest for holding things. So uh, Ark is what we've all grown up hearing, because Ark sounds kind of cool and unique or whatever. That's just a King James thing. It's just a big chest, and we're going to see that things are put into the chest, and there's a lid for the chest. Um, so uh, he says, uh, make, uh, they shall make an Ark of shittim wood or acacia wood, two cubits and a half. Now a cubit is from fingertip to elbow. Um, it's about a foot and a half, and so they're going to make uh, two and a half cubits long, which is uh, about four feet. Okay, so four feet uh, is the length, and then a cubit and a half, so we're looking at um, a little over two feet for the width of the chest, and a cubit and a half for the height, so the, the width and the height are the same dimension. You will overlay it with pure gold within and without. You shall overlay it and shall make upon it a crown of gold round about. So you, this is the box itself. This is not the lid. This is not the top part. This is just the box where everything's going to go in. And so there was going to there was going to be this wood, this acacia wood, this kind of red reddish wood, and, um, and then they were going to overlay it with gold. And then there was going to be a crown on the outside of the lip of the box. It's gonna, it literally would look like a crown, like the box was wearing a gold crown. All right, and then you will cast four rings of gold for it and put them on the four corners. And two rings shall be on the one side and two rings on the other. And you will make staves of shittim or acacia wood and overlay them with gold. And you will put the staves into the rings by the sides of the, of the ark or the chest and the, that the ark may be born with them. And so here's, here's the instruction that God gives. You're going to make this chest, and you're going to put four rings in it, and you're going to slide these two uh, staves, these long pieces of wood. And when people move this chest, when they carry this chest, they're, they're going to, to do it by lifting those sticks. Now, that's what God says. That's all he says. All right? Uh, 
And then it says, uh, verse 15, the staves shall be in the rings of the ark. They shall not be taken from it. So they couldn't take the staves or those big long poles out. Um, and you shall put the ark, uh, you shall put into the ark the testimony which I shall give you. So God's going to give Moses something to put inside the chest. And you shall take, you shall make a mercy seat. Now that word there for seat um, is, oops, wrong one, uh, is kara. Oh, no, nope, that ain't it. Where is it at? There it is. Uh, is Kapareth. Okay. So Kapareth is um, the, you can kind of see in there the word cap or top or lid. Um, it's translated sometimes as mercy seat, but it's actually a lid or a cap or a topping to go on a chest. And so we, we hear the, the mercy seat and we get the idea of the mercy seat because um, God talks about that's where I'm going to be, like a, a kind of a throne or this is where he's going to sit. But this isn't actually his throne. It's just his presence is going to be there. He's going to talk about where he's dwelling in the tabernacle and later the temple and stuff. So um, it's not a chair. There's not a chair on top of this box. It's just a flat lid. Um, there was a little kind of a, a space that was plate-like for them to put things if they needed to in between the two cherubs um and, and so there was a kind of a simplicity to it but there wasn't actually a chair there there's no seat there's nothing to to sit on specifically um so anyway he says make a, a, a mercy seat or a mercy uh lid of pure gold two cubits and a half shall be the length thereof and a cubit and a half the breadth thereof and so again this is this lid is going to fit perfectly with the length and the width of the the arc or the chest and you will make two cherubims of gold of beaten work shall you make them in two ends of the mercy seat so there was these two winged creatures and we know what cherubims are, are already because we've seen them back in uh, genesis chapter 3 when um, adam and eve were kicked out of the garden of eden there was a cherub that guarded the way back into eden uh, they were not allowed there it was a, a flaming sword that was there and there was this cherubim and it's basically one of the highest orders of angels. The cherubim, when we see them throughout uh, the books of, uh, the ones with apocalyptic language, the, the prophecy, revelation, those kinds of things, these are the, the, the big kind of super angels that are around the throne of God. They're the ones that are the closest to God. And so you have a representation of this, um, I'm not really sure I want to use the word honor guard or, or whatever these attendants that are closest to God representing that God was there and that when they came before this ark or this chest it was like coming before God and uh, worshiping like we talked about Job last time and so when you came before God to worship coming before him he had representatives of the angels that were around his throne and that's what the reminder of those angels were they couldn't see god they weren't supposed to make an image of god but the images of the angels that were there were a reminder that hey these are the the angels that are on either side of god um, in his throne room and so you are in the presence of god that's why these were put on the lid okay make one cherub on one end and the other on the other end even of the the mercy seat or lid shall you make the cherubims on the two ends thereof and the cherubim shall stretch forth their wings on high, covering the mercy lid with their wings. And their faces shall look one to another toward the mercy lid, shall the faces of the cherubim. So they were facing each other, and their wings were kind of outstretched, covering over the lid. And you can go on and look at like Google images and stuff, and you can see a lot of, of images of what people think the ark looked like. But the ark was lost. Nobody knows where the ark is, um, and there aren't really any pictures or drawings of the actual ark that we have so we don't we don't know what it exactly looks like we don't know when they built cherubims what did what did they actually detail those to look like we don't have an idea of anything more than the general description that you're getting here hey what's up um can you can just no sound please no sound okay so uh verse 21 and you shall put the mercy seat upon the ark uh, uh, and in the ark or chest you shall put the testimony that, shall I, that I shall give you this is this, these are going to be the stone tablets and there I will meet with you uh, this, is, this is the important thing there wherever this ark is 
it represented the presence of God. And part of that presence, that testament, that the 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 representative stone of uh, that, that, that was like this is the Old Testament, the covenant that I'm making with Israel, represented God's presence with them and His providence and His protection and uh, just everything that that His relationship entailed with the Israelite people. And that's, that's what this was about. So he says, there I will meet with you and I will commune with you from above the mercy lid from between the two cherubims which are upon the, ch- the chest of the testimony or the testament of all things which I shall give you in commandment unto the children of Israel. Now, this is, again, he's like, I'm going to give you some stone tablets, essentially, that are going to go in here. And they are representative of all things which I will give thee in commandment unto the children of Israel. So this isn't this isn't just ten things. This is all of the things. When God was here, God's not going to call Moses up on the mountain every time he wants to give Moses some things. They're going to build this, and they're going to build the tabernacle, and then the com- communication between God and Moses would then take place in this, this section of the tabernacle called the Holy of Holies. And this is where God would commune with Moses from then on and deliver all that he was going to command Israel to do. All of the laws, everything that pertained to this theocracy that God was establishing. Um, And I I want it to be understood that that this isn't just limited to these Ten Commandments that everybody goes off on. It's it's all of the commandments um, are represented in these ten. But that doesn't make those ten uh, any more or less than them and when we get to the new testament and it talks about the law being taken out of the way the ordinances whatever words are being used it's still all it's everything about this testament this uh, will this um, command this structure this pattern everything is all bound up together and you can't separate them out so when god took any part of it out of the way he was saying that he was taking the whole, the whole law needed to be changed according to Hebrews chapter 7 uh, because uh, it was it was lesser it was uh, not able to do things that the new covenant was able to do so um, all right verse 23 and you shall take you shall also make a table so this is a new structure he's already told him how to build the chest it says, you'll make a, a table out of the shittim wood or the uh, acacia wood, two cubits, you shall like the length of it, and, and a cubit the breadth. Uh, so three feet and, and then a foot and a half, uh, and a cubit and a half, the height thereof, uh, so a little over two feet, uh, it's about waist high. And you will overlay it with pure gold and make a crown of gold around about it. So it was, it was going to have, kind of like the chest did, it was going to have this um, uh, beautiful gold uh, kind of lip, if you will, uh, around the edges of it um, as a border around the outside and you will make of it four, four rings of gold and put the rings in the four corners that are in the four feet thereof over against the border shall the rings be for places of the staves to bear the table so again you have this table just like the chest or just like the Ark of the Covenant um, you have this table that was considered a, 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 a sanctified thing a, a uh, a holy thing and just like the ark it was going to have those staves pass through the rings and it was to be carried by the staves not by the table itself uh, <clears throat> verse 28 and you will make the staves of shittim wood or acacia wood and overlay them with gold that the table may be born with them so god is giving the instructions he says this is what i want you to do and and what you don't see here with the ark of the covenant and what you don't see here with the table Excuse me. Is God saying anything about what I don't want you to do? God is not giving the instruction here, don't touch the ark. God is not saying, don't touch the, the table. He's just saying, you're going to put these staves in, and you're going to carry it by the staves. When God gives us a command that's specific, we don't have the authority uh, in fact, it is gross arrogance on our part to say, well, I know God said to do it this way, but this way would be more convenient, or this way would be easier, or whatever, <clears throat> and to just do things our own way. 
God is when when God specifies something. This is the, some people call this the law of silence. I don't agree with that. Um, I don't think so- silence authorizes anything. But um, I know that the churches of Christ talk about this idea of pattern, um, and I call it the law of specificity. When a thing is specified, the very nature of specifying a thing automatically eliminates all all other kinds of that thing. So if um, if God were to command Christians to go preach the gospel by riding a donkey. By specifying a donkey, he would eliminate all other forms of travel when we were to go preach the gospel. Thankfully, he didn't. He didn't specify. He just said, go preach the gospel so we can go however we want. In this case, I'm going by internet. I can reach uh, quite a few people this way. Um, I also go physically um, and we can talk to people. I've been on mission trips and, and whatever. So there's a lot of ways we can go because God did not specify. There are things that God has specified in the New Testament. Um, In terms of worship, worship is always specified. Um, God has commanded us to worship in partaking of the Lord's Supper, and the specificity is in what we partake of. You know, we couldn't have hamburgers or pizza as part of the Lord's Supper because he specified bread, and we couldn't have sodas or (laughs) unsweet tea or whatever we want. He specified fruit of the vine, grape juice, uh, wine, wine, however you want to call it. Um, and so in specifying those things, God has said only those things are authorized. And for us to go outside of that um, is arrogance. It's, it's saying we know better how to worship God than what God has told us. Same thing is true in our singing. A lot of people uh, know the churches of Christ specifically because we don't use mechanical instruments in our worship. When we, when we sing, we sing everybody it's congregational and it's a cappella. there's it's just voices um we don't clap we don't use mechanical instruments there's no humming there's a lot of things that we exclude that a lot of other people include because we understand that god has specified singing and not only did he specify singing he specified singing for the purpose of teaching and admonishing and all of those things that I just mentioned, the clapping, the humming, the, the mechanical instruments don't teach anything. They don't communicate. Singing is a mnemonic device. And so when God specifies, he specified for a purpose, for a reason. And we, we don't have the perspective, we don't have the knowledge or the wisdom to say, God, I have a better way. And so I'm going to do it that way. And so uh, here God is showing that. He's showing that. I'm giving you these specific instructions, follow those instructions. And then we see later on what happens when people go outside of those instructions. Uh, when they go beyond the pattern, God is not happy with it. And under the Old Testament times, there were some very powerful, fatal um, uh, examples made uh, to get the point across so that people would learn when God says something, he needs it. So, <clears throat> all right, so he makes he makes the table and he puts the... Uh, the staves there, the rings for the staves to carry it. Um, and then verse 29, you will make dishes thereof and spoons thereof and covers thereof and bowls thereof to cover with a, of pure gold shall you make them. So there's these dishes that are made of pure gold. Later we'll see in Daniel uh, that Nebuchadnezzar's uh, grandson becomes king uh, and he's basically king for a night and he steals these dishes from out of the temple and he eats on them. He just he's going to eat them like a normal meal because they're they're beautiful they're solid gold um and that's the last night that he's king the first night that he's king the last night he's king because the uh the medo persians come in and, and conquer and he dies um verse 30 and you will set upon the table the showbread this idea of showbread is just uh the same bread it's it's an unleavened bread um but it's this it's just the the idea of a meal or uh, the uh, bread, grain, food. Uh, there's a, a in the Greek, the the word trophe uh, is used. It's it's a kind of a generic word for the idea of bread. We know in this context that it is a special kind of bread. It's the same kind of bread that was used in the Passover, uh, so it's unleavened, and um, it is actually a pointer. The, the idea of the Passover bread, there's actually a pointer to the New Testament. There, there's, this is a type pointing to an any type of the bread that we partake of in the Lord's Supper. Um, it's supposed to be an unleavened bread. 
And the reason for that is because Christ is our Passover. When we, when we look at the sacrifice that Christ made on the cross, the antitype there of the sacrificial lamb, all of that's bound up in this idea of Passover. And so the showbread here is a reminder of them every time those sacrifices are made, a reminder of the Passover where God freed them from Egypt, brought them out of bondage, and made them a new nation. When we as Christians look back at the Old Testament and we see those things, we see in them the type of, of what we go through. We're in bondage to sin, and when we uh, are immersed into Christ, or immersed in water into Christ, then the old man is destroyed, the sin, the wickedness is destroyed, and the new man rises up out of the water, a new creature, completely sin-free. We're not sinners anymore, we're saints. And... Um, we partake weekly of this Lord's Supper, um, according to 1 Corinthians 11 and 1 Corinthians 16, uh, and the example given in Acts 20. Uh, we partake of this weekly to remind us of the Passover, that God passes over us. He doesn't see our sins. He remembers them no more. They've been washed clean. He only sees his son. And so the this, this symbolism is important to understand um, because of the type any type relationship and, and really driving home um, what is happening when we become a Christian. So, all right, verse 31, and you'll make a candlestick of pure gold of beaten work shall the candlestick be made, a uh, shaft and his branches, his bowls, his knops, that word knops is like knobs or the ends of it, and his flowers shall be of the same. Uh, the six branches shall come out of the sides, three to the left, and or three of uh, Three branches of the candlestick out of one side, and three branches of the candlestick out of the other. It's a very familiar candle uh, stick. We we know this um, because of a lot of the Jewish traditions that have been around for uh, you know since since World War II ish times. The the idea of the menorah, um, and so this this goes all the way back here to the very beginning of uh, when the Israelites were coming. Because remember, we're we're not in the forty years of wandering just yet. They haven't attempted to go in and got scared by all the giants. This is still just the first few weeks where they've been coming out, first couple of months where they've been coming out of Egypt. Um, and so this menorah is made, or this candlestick is made, to go on the table. And so they're, they're going to do that. And then they're going to make three bowls, like unto almonds. So they have this, this kind of football shape to them with a knob and a flower on one branch, and three bowls made like almonds in the other branch, um, and a knop and a flower, so that the six branches that come out of the candlestick. So look at, it, at each branch, you got the one in the middle, and then you got each of the three branches, you got this bowl that comes out on each each top. It's a, it's a tiny bowl, it's where the, the, the wax candle is going to go, but it looks like an almond, and there's a little knob and a flower uh, on each of those little bowls. Um, and then it says, uh, and so, so in the six branches that come out of the candlestick. And in the candlestick shall be four bowls made like unto almonds with their knobs and their flowers. Um, and there shall be a knob under two branches of the same and a knob under the two branches of the same and a knob under two branches of the same according to the six branches. So it's, it's talking about, hey, this is, this is how they're going to go. There's going to be three here with knobs and three here with knobs going down the main stem of the, the thing. It's just given a, a solid description of the, the candlestick. Um, and their knobs and their branches shall be of the same. All of it will be one beaten work of pure gold. I love uh, so they're, it, it's the single piece of gold. They put it together and then they just shape it out of that single piece of gold. Um, and they, they're going to beat it with hammers and, and shape it uh, out of that. And then it says, you will make seven lamps thereof. And they shall light the lamps thereof and they will, that they may give light over against it. Now here's an interesting thing. We see this again, this idea of the lampstands in the book of Revelation. How many congregations were there that represented the church uh, in that book? There were seven. What was the symbol that represented each congregation? It was a lampstand. And so the, the, those, those symbols that we see in Revelation aren't just things that can be looked at in isolation. We don't just read the book of Revelation and try to understand it. We actually, when we get into the books of prophecy and we get into the New Testament and we get into the book of Revelation and we try to understand those things, we let the Bible interpret it. 
And so what's the idea behind the lampstand? It's about giving light. And so each of those lampstands was a congregation giving light or knowledge of the gospel to the world. But if they weren't going to be faithful, their lampstand would be removed because God did not want them preaching a corrupted gospel. Um, they would not they would not be there to give light anymore because of, of their wickedness. And so that's that's the warning that John is giving to them. But we find the anchor in reality here in the books of Moses. <clears throat> All right, verse 38, And the tongs thereof and the snuff dishes thereof shall be of pure gold. So the snuff dishes were to put the candles out, um, and the tongs were to, so they didn't have to touch it, they could put the, the candles in with the tongs. Of a talent of pure gold shall he make it with all these vessels. Now, so what that means is, is that when you look at all the dishes and the candle and everything that goes, it was a talent of gold. A talent of gold is the weight of a, essentially a fit human male it's 50 kilograms and um it it's a lot of gold and remember this is this is god giving instructions to moses we haven't got to the people's reaction to this command yet um which is a good one um but uh the the command is from god to moses at this point and so he he gives them all these instructions and then look what verse 40 says and look that you make them after their pattern which was showed you in the mount so again god iterates this idea of you follow the pattern that i give you that i'm talking to you right now here in the mountain you do that and this is actually quoted this verse exodus 25 40 is actually quoted over in uh, the book of hebrews chapter 8 verse 5 and uh, it's talking about the old testament and it says uh, let me, let me back up to verse, uh, <clears throat> well, let's just read verse 1. It says, Now, of the things which we have spoken, this is the sum. We have such a high priest, talking about Christ, who is set on the right hand of the throne of majesty in the heavens. Christ is high priest, and he is a king on his throne. A minister of the sanctuary. Well, where's the sanctuary? That's the tabernacle that Moses just got instructions for. That's the temple that David designed and Solomon built. Um, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle which the lord pitched and not man well what is this temple not made with hands okay we've heard that phrase before it's the church for every high priest is ordained to offer gifts and sacrifices whereof it is of necessity that this man has someone also to offer for if he were on earth he should not be a priest seeing that there are priests that offer gifts according to the law the law here is the law of moses so if, if Jesus were still on earth, he couldn't be a priest because he was of the tribe of Judah, not of the tribe of Levi. And so uh, the Hebrew writer is saying there are still priests, there are Jewish priests, and they serve, who serve, who is, is referring back to people, so it's talking about the priests, these priests serve uh, unto the example and shadow of heavenly things of spiritual things as moses was admonished of god when he was about to make the tabernacle well this is referring back to exodus 25 that we just read see saith he that you make all things according to the pattern showed pattern showed to thee in the mount well, that is quoting exodus 25 and verse 40 and it's very very important to understand that we follow god's pattern and then you can keep reading but now hath he obtained a more excellent ministry by how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant which is established on better promises for if that first covenant had been faultless we're talking about all the things that are going on in exodus right now the ark and the, the tables of stone and all of that for if the first covenant had been faultless then should no place have been sought for the second and so he uh, he said in verse 8 i'll finish there for finding fault with them talking about israel he said behold the days come says the lord when i will make a new covenant this is quoting jeremiah with the house of israel and with the house of judah so um, all of the things that we're reading here this is the establishment of uh, the israelite theocracy but these are shadows these are these are types pointing to new testament anti-type spiritual realities that are higher and better than the physical nation that was hebrew so anybody who's holding on to the old testament whether they are uh, claiming to be a jew you know they might be descended from from the jews of old or whatever 
um, or maybe they're a Gentile and they're they're wanting to hold on to the Old Testament. They're holding on to a lesser covenant, a worse covenant. And all of these things that we're reading about, they're, hey Holly, uh, they're, they're just types. They're shadows. And today we don't even have the shadow anymore. That's gone. Uh, the, the Israelite nation, the Jewish nation, was wiped out by the Romans in the first century. Um, so all we have now is just a lingering reflection of that shadow. Um, that's, that's all taken out of the way. And it was nailed to the cross. Christ is the king. Christ is the high priest. Um, we are the temple of God, the Christians, the church that, that Jesus built, the church of Christ. Um, and we have to make sure that we are holding to the pattern that he gave us in the new covenant, just as Moses was supposed to hold to the pattern that he was given in the old covenant. So, all right, that's the end of the chapter. Um, I only 35 minutes, that's pretty good. Um, that's about where I wanted to end this. So uh, I got to go to the store and I got to cook some dinner and stuff. So thank you guys for joining. I uh, hope you got something out of this. If you have any questions, you can leave them in the comments or you can message me privately. Um, some of you even have my phone number. You're welcome to text or call. Uh, I don't mind talking about this at all. I love talking about this. So um, feel free to ask those questions. Uh, if you uh, got something out of this and you think this is a positive message, please share it. Um, I'd really like to, to, to spread this as far and as wide as I possibly can. Uh, but uh, for those of you who did tune in, thank you very much. And uh, we will see you guys next time.